All right. Earth and space scientists in 148 nations across every part of the world. We publish 24 peer-reviewed journals, convene meetings, and provide the needed career support and science training for the Earth and space science community. This year at COP, the parties are conducting the first global stock take, really to assess the progress towards the goals of the Paris Agreement, aimed at limiting global warming at an at most two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The goal for the nations is to prepare for more ambitious climate action plans, because the reality is we already know we are far behind in meeting some of these emission reduction goals. Meanwhile, the impacts of climate change continue to unfold before our eyes. Storms are becoming more destructive and powerful. Droughts and heat waves are more severe, frequent and, prolong and, frequent and prolonged. Sea level rise is eating away at the coastlines and of course worsening flooding. These and other drastic environmental changes are disrupting food supplies, upending local and national economies, and deepening public health crises, with the poorest among us sometimes paying the heaviest price. These impacts reinforce the need for us to double down on the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and prepare for the worst effects of climate change through adaptation and resilience efforts. One growing challenge is this threat of exceeding the 1.5 goal. The IPCC recently found that all pathways that li limit warming even to 1.5 degrees Celsius depend on some measure of carbon removal. So faced with these major threats and the need for action, the world is increasingly considering um, the, the uh, intervention approaches, also called engineering, to remove carbon and lessen the harmful effects of climate change. Today, there are a range of climate intervention strategies that are being used and or researched, everything from reforestation and restorative ag agriculture to some new approaches, including terrestrial and ocean-based carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation modification. These technologies are at different scales of their maturity. Some of them are untested and their consequences are not well understood at the moment. There are major political and ethical questions about the significant risks and potential trade-offs these approaches may bring and how they would be measured against the risks of a warming world. The enormity of what's at stake requires a measured, transparent, inclusive, and really altogether ethical foundation for evaluating the impacts of climate intervention technologies. Recognizing the need for guiding principles in this fast-moving, dynamic space and building on AGU's longstanding history of advancing and advocating for strong scientific ethics, AGU is facilitating the development of a draft ethical framework for climate intervention research, experimentation, and deployment. Currently under development, the ethical framework will serve as a resource to help governments, researchers, NGOs, and the private sector make responsible decisions when engaging in climate intervention research policy or practice. The framework's guiding principles highlight the steps that could be taken when considering any climate intervention technology. And these draft principles include the need for complying with applicable local, national, and intergovernmental policies, active and early pu public participation and local community engagement, Assessment of and consideration for environmental, procedural, and intergenerational justice. Open and transparent data sharing, monitoring, and reporting. And those are just to name a few of some of the guiding principles that can inform this ethical conversation. Like the broadly accepted practices and ethical standards many scientists use today in conducting their work, um, both in biomedicine, genetics, and others, 
The aforementioned principles help build consensus around strong and consistent ethical practices and guide the evolving field of study, in this case, climate intervention. What this framework does make clear, and I do wanna make clear today as well, is that aggressive actions towards carbon emission reductions must remain the primary strategy for reversing and addressing climate change. Climate intervention is one element or lever of that can help inform a larger strategy to address our climate crisis. There is no substitution for emission reductions if we were to make substantial progress both now and in the years ahead. The framework also builds on the wealth of pioneering work within the field, such as the 2009 Oxford Principles and the 2010 Asilomar Recommendations, and also the UNESCO, UNESCO Etho, Ethics Report just released a few days ago. This framework is intended to build on that progress and ensure that this is not only a process grounded in strong science, but also heavily informed by the global community. The advisory board, um, some of who are here today, um, comprise a panel of experts on climate science, ethics, policy, and techno technological innovations from every region around the globe. Additionally, earlier this year, the draft framework went through a rigorous three-month public comment period and consultation process to include more holistic input, not just from scientists and ethicists, but also community voices, youth advocates, and many more. This framework truly is informed by and built for cis society. The framework, which will be translated into multiple languages, is set to be rolled out by the second quarter of 2024, and we look forward to sharing it with you all at COP29. So I've kind of set the stage um, and described the ethical framework for climate intervention, but now I kind of wanted to turn over to a wonderful panel um, to take a step back and discuss the broader challenges, opportunities, and innovations when considering climate intervention and how ethics inform this important dialogue. So first, I am joined by Margaret Leinen, Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography and Vice Chancellor for Marine Science at the University of California, San Diego. And again, I also wanted to say thank you, Margaret, for uh, your leadership in convening this important ocean pavilion. Thank you, please join me. Yes, all right, yes. And then next we have Matthias uh, Honegger, who is a senior researcher and head of the business field per, per, for Perspectives Climate Group. Hello, Matthias. Next we have Janos Pasteur, the executive director of the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative, who is based in Geneva. Thank you for joining us, John Janos. Next, Maranel Ubado, a registered social worker and master of environment management, environmental management candidate at Duke University. Thank you for being here, Maranel. And we have one additional panelist who may be joining a bit late. Um, but that will be uh, Sarah Ash Shalan, um, who is the founding partner of Aeon Collective. Um, and we look forward to her joining the panel when she can arrive. I know she had um, multiple events back to back. So I am going to sit down on the panel um, and kick us off with a few questions. Test, all right, wonderful. So I'm gonna start at the end with Margaret. Um, Margaret, you were one of the organizers of the 2010 Asilomar International Conference on Climate Intervention Technologies. Could you share your views on how the fields of carbon dioxide removal and other forms of tech have evolved over time and really what ethical challenges and questions remain from your perspective? Sure, Th thanks Mark. Uh, so I started, uh, work toward the Asilomar Conference in 2008. And at that time, uh, there were a lot of people that were thinking about research on climate intervention. Uh, and I will specifically take off the table mechanical carbon dioxide removal, you know, essentially scrubbing the atmosphere. Uh, a lot of people were thinking about research, but 
they weren't being funded to do research. There was a little bit of funding for modeling, uh, but nothing for doing experimental work. And the community, many in the community felt that it was really important to do some research to either make a decision that the negative implications of a technique were, um, were big enough that it shouldn't be considered, or to look at whether uh, some of them had uh, less uh, environmental consequences and should have some more research done. Um, about this time, the UK House of Commons uh, undertook a special study uh, of climate intervention, geoengineering, and they asked a group from Oxford University to consider principles that should guide uh, any research on geoengineering. And uh, the Oxford principles came as a result of that. And since that time, there hasn't really been a lot of change in those principles. But uh, at the time, uh, they were considered but rejected by the public uh, because they said that, number one, the scientists who were involved in climate intervention research or wanted to be uh, were not involved in, in developing the rules or principles. And uh, other groups like uh, the public or government or ethicists weren't involved in putting together the rules. So we wanted to uh, take another stab at that uh, with the inclusion of other groups. And so we looked back at uh, what had happened with recombinant DNA research. And at, when people first started considering recombinant DNA uh, research, everybody was afraid of people cloning humans, uh, people doing other things that, were, that would upset uh, the general public and were considered uh, uh, unethical. And uh, they were having a great deal of trouble getting money to do research. Uh, so they had uh, Paul Berg, um, who w later went on to win a Nobel Prize for his research on recombinant DNA, uh, uh, convened a group uh, at a Silomar conference center in California. And he included the scientists who were interested in doing this. He also included government. He included ethicists. Uh, he included uh, historians of science. Uh, they developed a set of principles. Uh, they, uh, the, and at that time, the US uh, uh, National Institutes of Health agreed upon the principles and said that they would follow those in funding. So we purposefully designed the Asilomar Conference on Climate Intervention to model that. And Paul Berg actually became an advisor for it. So in addition to scientists, we included ethicists, lawyers, uh, historians of science, uh, economists, um, journalists, uh, NGOs, uh, philanthropy, government, and private sector, and put together a set of principles that weren't a lot different from the Oxford principles, but at least were considered by a much larger group. Um, this still didn't do anything to really help research. And in fact, uh, a few years later, uh, a couple of uh, big experiments that had been funded by environmental or uh, research councils uh, were stopped by public uh, outcry against them. Uh, one was the Bristol University's work uh, looking at, uh, uh, they wanted to look at solar radiation modification. And as an initial step, they wanted to do some, uh, some studies of particle size and, uh, and scattering. So they proposed to uh, put a, a hose with a, a nozzle on it, spraying water vapor into the atmosphere about 300 meters up. And 
when the public in around Bristol found out they were doing this and that it was in some way associated with solar radiation mod modification, uh, the, the experiment was shut down. And it was actually the end of that research project. And then later on, uh, the Scopex uh, program in the Arctic uh, was also uh, shut down by, because of public uh, outcry. So what has changed since then? Uh, to lead us to believe that there's any use for having a, a set of principles. I think the big thing that's changed is that the private sector and some philanthropies have started to fund the research uh, outside of government. Back in 2008, 2010, we thought that only the government would and, and research councils would fund this sort of work, uh, and that's really changed. And so if this is going on, what are the ethical principles that ought to be applied to it? And so for me, I think that that really sets the stage for what, um, what Carnegie has done, what Aspen has recently uh, published, and what AGU is doing. Absolutely. Thank you again for that additional context and, and the challenges you've experienced and how the dialogue has advanced. Um, with that nice transition, I thought I would pass the mic to Janos uh, to kind of discuss that within the C2G initiative, um, which is wrapping up relatively soon, um, you know, if you could highlight some of the main takeaways for the work that you've been working and the team has been working on for the past five years. Um, and how C2G uh, is working to catalyze the creation of effective governance for different climate-altering technologies. Well, th thank you for the question. Thank you for inviting me. It's actually been seven years, seven. Uh, not five. My and apologize, it, it, it seven. Feels, it, it feels like 20. So uh, <laughs> um, maybe just to start with, I think I can say that I've learned a lot about these issues. I think I can speak for my colleagues, some of whom are here, that we have learned a lot. Um, but still, too little is known about this issue in the general public. Even in the specialized public, too little is known. And very often what is known is not evidence-based. And people just have a feeling, I'm against it, I'm for it. It's good, it's the best thing since apple pie and coke, or it's over my dead body. But not evidence-based, and that's a real problem. Uh, now, in spite of fantastic developments all over the place, uh, solar photovoltaics, electric cars, you name it, I mean, a lot of it is being discussed here, the reality is that the climate crisis now is worse than it was when we started our work. We're worse off. And that's not a good thing to say, <laughs> but that's the reality. And right now, uh, it doesn't look like we're suddenly on a new good path. So this is a problem. This has helped us, unfortunately. I keep saying to friends, how is your work? I say, unfortunately, it's going very well. Because there, is more, there are more people and, um, who, who feel that maybe, maybe, not for sure, but maybe we might need these techniques as well as what we know we have to do, which is to reduce our emissions. So there has been more interest in our work. Initially, when we started, uh, especially about uh, solar radiation modification, people would look at us and say, what, what planet are you from? You know, is this science fiction or is it something real? And then slowly, over the years, the same people and maybe other people, we started noticing that government officials, ambassadors, they had briefings in front of them, sometimes using our own materials, sometimes their own materials, but they were briefed. That's interesting. Then, uh, a few years on, these same people and others, as we were continuing to talk, and that is our mission. Our mission has been to bring these issues to the attention of governments. Not to promote these technologies, not to be against them, but to bring it to their attention. So, uh, after a few years, what we noticed is, is that they, they actually started discussing the issues. Okay, what about the risks? What about the benefits? What about the moral hazard? What about this? What about that? And so we had very interesting discussions bilaterally, also in groups. And then more recently, and this is interesting, I would say in the last year, the same government people we've been talking to, and again, some others, because the group has expanded, 
are now talking about what are we going to do about it. And that's a big difference. It's not about I'm for or against. They might still be, uh, but the point is they recognize that they need to do something about it. And in that sense, the, the short answer to your question is that we feel, uh, after seven years of work, that we have accomplished our mission. And we feel very comfortable in saying that we bring this uh, initiative to end. We always said it would come to an end. We didn't want to set up an organization. It was an initiative. And uh, uh, we always said we would end. And uh, this is a good time to come uh, to a conclusion because uh, governments, key civil society entities are aware. Now, we're not claiming it's all because of our work, clearly not, but we feel that we have contributed to it. And very importantly, even if we wanted to continue, even if we, we, we felt that we, we need to, uh, the, the idea of continuing and doing the same thing what we have been doing, we don't believe is the right thing to do. Because now the time is for a different kind of, you know, we, our, our focus was impartiality, and catalytic work. But now it's a time for others to come, those who are promoting these technologies, these approaches, or those who are against it, or those who are not sure, but they want to find out. They have to push the agenda forward, and they have to go for it, against it, maybe more research, less research, whatever it is, it is their role, and it is not for us. So we feel uh, we, we're comfortable in wrapping up after seven years of work. Thank you. Well, a big congratulations to you and your colleagues for the work you have been doing for the past seven years um, to advance this dialogue in an impartial way. I think it's quite important. Um, moving next to Matthias. Um, so Perspectives Climate Research uh, is a small independent research organization kind of looking at possible solutions um, to international climate change uh, challenges and needs. Um, I was hoping if you could highlight some of the ways Perspectives is navigating the climate intervention space from your perspective. Yeah, thanks. So um, I, I believe I can connect nicely onto what was said, though when, when I was initially invited, I was, uh, to be honest, relatively hesitant. And uh, that is for one reason, which is that I tend to think about this in a slightly different way. I tend to think when we take public policy decisions, so decisions affecting us as a society at the global level or at national levels, those decisions are measured not per se by their uh, quality, because quality is in the eye of the beholder, but rather by, by their legitimacy or the legitimacy behind the process that led to those decisions. And that process in and of itself can often be a measure of quality again. So rather than thinking about um, ethics or, or an ethical framework as something that a few people can come up with in some room at, the, at a conference, which th this is very important as well, obviously. Rather than that, I think of it as a, a, a living entity almost, as an entity that operates in the, uh, in the political space where people, voters, civil society organizations, researchers as well, and evidently political representatives sort of interact in a continual manner. And that tends then over time to express itself in more or less formalized norms or principles often, uh, sometimes explicitly referred to as principles when they are really uh, clear and, uh, well, firmly worded. So that's how I think of principles. And then the question is, well, those are perhaps better referred to as governance principles. And so uh, now getting specifically to climate interventions, uh, I have viewed the carbon dioxide removal space in particular through that lens and asked myself in uh, the last two years, what governance principles do we already have that are underlying the normative landscape that we uh, navigate through in these halls, in, uh, in the respective um, capitals, back at home, uh, what are those normative landscapes and how do they express in governance principles that are in many ways already formalized in, in multilateral um, agreements, uh, international governance, and 
from that, I derived, and this is a concrete paper that I wrote at some point, a ABC of governance principles for carbon dioxide removal policy. And so that is just a attempt at capturing that rich landscape and to show that, well, in fact, although this seems to be a novel issue, there is already a normative landscape and we better consider that quite carefully when we talk about how to devise policy and how to measure the success of such policy. So this is on CDR. From that, I have recently, though I've been an observer of the uh, discussion of solar radiation modification for uh, over 10 years, I have only recently began uh, taking a more uh, serious look at this as a governance problem. And I've done so in a similar logic um, in, in thinking how to mobilize the often unexpressed norms and values that are underlying our ways of thinking about such a contentious topic in particular, and how to mobilize that to, well, to, to be able to structure political decisions um, in such a manner that although nobody will be happy at the end of the day, perhaps everyone is equally unhappy, which is the ideal case that you have in policy decisions. Um, and perhaps connecting to Jonas's work in the last few years, I've been very encouraged to see uh, the progress that CGG has made be because essentially I believe that without flushing out those views, without having those difficult conversations, we risk to take very bad decisions, not only in terms of their outcomes, probably, but also in terms of their process, because those decisions that take place without having had those conversations, without having had them rooted in the already legitimately established governance landscape, uh, well, we, we have basically random decisions that are uh, dictatorial in nature. And so the antidote to this, in my view, is clearly to have those discussions early on, difficult debates, deliberations, um, and science-based evaluations, and, and to do that so that we can build a basis for accountable decisions. And this is, in my uh, interpretation, really the essence of what would constitute perhaps an ethical approach or an ethical framework on climate interventions is to mobilize these uh, voices. And perhaps I can tie this together in point, pointing forward um, as I'm starting in January uh, 2024 uh, to lead a project under the EU Horizon program, um, which is, I hope, doing exactly what I just described uh, by uh, exploring the conditions for responsible research into SRM and its very many implications, and to do that in a participatory manner, to draw on lessons learned from other governance challenges that we've had in the past as global uh, societies, and to do that in a fundamentally, hopefully, accountable and ethical manner. Uh, so obviously a high standard, but I think this is what we should be aspiring to. Wonderful, and thank you for those contributions and breaking down the different perspectives of how you can uh, inform ethics. Um, next, Marinelle. Um, you are an early career researcher and also a seasoned climate activist. Um, could you describe kind of from your view the intersections of climate solutions, including climate interventions, with environmental justice. Thank you so much for that, and um, good afternoon to everybody. So the intersection of climate solutions, including um, climate intervention, um, with environmental justice is, we all know, a critical aspect of addressing climate change. And environmental justice emphasizes fair treatment and um, meaningful involvement of all people. And that includes um, people regardless of their race, regardless of their color, regardless of their national origin or income in environmental um, decision making. And as a researcher, community mobilizer, and an activist, I see the importance of ensuring the climate intervention technologies not only address um, climate issues, but also uphold principles of justice. Um, climate interventions have the potential impact of vulnerable communities disproportionately, and I think a lot of our panelists have said that earlier too. Um, therefore, it's crucial to integrate principles of distributive justice 
intergenerational justice, um, corrective justice, procedural justice, and ecological justice into the development and deployment of these technologies. This includes um, actively involving affected communities in decision-making processes and ensuring that the benefits and the burdens of the climate interventions are distributed um, equitably. Wonderful, and thank you for kind of breaking down the different, when really working with or in a community um, where these te technologies may be experimented with. Um, so last, welcome Sarah. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, Sarah, so going to your question, um, can you describe a little bit more about your work at Aon Strategy and your views on kind of the growing call for climate solutions um, while also balancing the need for environmental, to be, to be environmentally and socially responsible? Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Sarah's my sister, I'm Shal. Oh, but we're I'm wearing so the same color, Abaya, so, so apologize. you're totally, uh, totally allowed. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for joining us. I think the fact that uh, we have so many people in a room to talk about a very difficult conversation is already indicative of the level of engagement that this has, but also for those of us, me included, who fear the potential runaway effects of climate change, but also let's say, the ability of one person to dictate what that future will look like. It's good to see so much uh, engaged faces in the room. And allow me to start uh, with a bit of a reflection on our journey and how we came about uh, to discuss this. I see a very familiar face. Good to see you, Janos. And congratulations on a very hard one. Uh, uh, the first time I've met Janos, uh, we were discussing some of the work that they're conducting on CDR. And what I told him was, I remember the day when that used to be also called geoengineering, right? Um, this was my first intervention into this space, even prior to climate policy, of innovation and sustainability, this bigger blanket umbrella of what was called geoengineering. And to me, at that moment, it was more of a question of how do we ensure that we differentiate between the, some of those interventions that were a little bit arguably safer to deploy, and those that they, they had a lot of unknowns or unknown unknowns that one needed to wrap their head around the science. And most importantly, as I remember as a grad student, and we got an A plus for that report, is that the importance of governance, right? Um, uh, grad school was back in 2012, so that's been a, a mile away. Um, Nuran, my partner who, in crime, uh, who's not here with us, and myself, went into the space of Eon Collective, which is the nonprofit that I'm more proud of, the importance of the question was, how do we tend to the public good and how do we do it in a way that was independent, that did not uh, rely on one client or their vision of what that pathway looked like, and where we were able to talk, sometimes uh, we were told in controversial ways, but I think there should be no controversy when speaking about science, when speaking about uh, having that lead the conversation and have it not be the sentiments, let's say, of certain individuals within ecosystems. Where I come from, I'm from Saudi Arabia. The temperament when we first started to roll up our sleeves and play into this field was that, okay, maybe the Paris Agreement and the Paris Agreement was the end of it. So even discussions around net zero were very controversial when we were trying to push for it, right? It was more of a question of, let's stick to the Paris Agreement language of the balance between sources and sinks, which essentially said meant net zero. Uh, but what I, understood very early on in this process is what we're thinking of potential implications somewhere down the line is actually with us. So it's not the ministry of the future, let's say, that's envisioning some period in the future where we'd be deploying some of these technologies. Actually, we've already engineered our atmosphere without knowing it. The moment that we decided to burn coal, and with it, the particulate matters, is when we started as humans influencing that sphere. Uh, Volcanoes have been doing it for a long period of time. Um, there's been some science that was trying to be pushed among the horizons where they, there was a desire and a wish to ensure that this was a bit more quantified. I can tell you for one, our region in Saudi Arabia, I think you had uh, our colleagues in the AG were telling us there was a bit of difficulty to even find engagement. The reason being is that we were very fearful to be seen of even remotely looking at that direction to show the seriousness with which we're tackling the decarbonization problem. You know, mitigation is a massive area of focus for us, but so is adaptation. But to us as an independent organization, you know, parts that we choose not to engage with are just not going to disappear. 
Um, as a matter of fact, experience has told us that they'll become more and more fraught. Uh, we're in COP28 after massive uh, relief on my end, because uh, after studying what climate policy was and seeing it being deployed on the ground in, in COP21 and seeing how difficult and fraught line by line item negotiations were, I thought this is never going to happen. But lo and behold, you could tell that there was momentum towards reaching an agreement in COP21. We're a few cops later and we're seeing more of this antagonistic approach of are we doing enough? Uh, are, do we trust the perspectives of one another? This crisis of trust is becoming more and more large, both between countries' positions and how they relate to one another, but also between communities. Um, the forgotten, I always recall, is those pockets in the global north, not solely in the global south, but in the global north that no one even talks about. Um, I give an example of Harlem. Uh, we just came, New York is like a second home to us, and everyone focuses on it, and it is a very developed region. But go to Harlem and talk to the layman there who's deciding between energizing for electricity or for heat, and that becomes a much more difficult conversation to be had. So to go back and, and not to beat around the bush, to the issue at hand here, it's a very fraught subject that people also fear the signaling of being on a panel to even discuss it, let alone get to the nitty gritty of what it takes. So uh, as the non, let's say, technical expert, I, I, I shy of being in a panel with the people like Janos and, and, and other friends, and maybe I'm a bit biased to people that I know uh, that, that have a, a long work in this region. But it's just to say that this is a space that we have to keep our eye on if we do not engage or choose to engage with it in a way that's transparent, that's inclusive, then we'll be doing ourselves a massive uh, you know, uh, mistake. Uh, it, it's these difficult conversations that need to be had and need to be had in the best, most transparent vehicles to ensure that we're safeguarding our today before our tomorrow because the risk and the fact of the matter is this can happen you know, upon the decision of one billionaire or, or one country, we wouldn't necessarily even know before seeing the effects of what's happening. And conversations around the runaway effect of climate change, the cascading effects, the unknown unknowns, makes it even more dangerous to not discuss this in a scientific manner and ensure that this difficult conversation is bringing the importance of this topic to fore, as opposed to shying away from it. So if you allow me, Max, uh, I, uh, Mark, sorry. Uh, I, uh, you that, can call me whatever uh, you would like. For, for me, for me, it's <laughs> absolutely not allowed. But it's just to say that uh, thank you to everyone in the room for having the courage to partake in this very important conversation. And hopefully we have some time for a QA. and I think what you need to ask from every one of us on this panel is these really difficult questions that no one wants to wrap their head around. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and we will be going to audience questions. So if you have some, start preparing. I'm going to do one quick question to the panel while you think of your questions, and then I will hand the mic to um, someone who will help to uh, navigate the mic in the audience. But I think going to that last point, um, there are tricky questions, right? There's the more uh, this conversation advances, the moral hazard argument is elevated, the more we heard a little bit earlier, the conversation of we're moving too slow or we're moving way too fast in this space. When you think about those valid voices on, on all sides, right? Whether it's from the scientific community focusing on one very specific phenomenon of research in this area, to the policy, to the community concerns, um, to the environmental justice implications. Um, do you have any ways that you've seen that have worked well when engaging with those audiences? Whether it's directly related to this, but in general, how do you make that outreach and what have you seen um, to be uh, effective means of doing that? Um, and I'm going to ask it to the full panel, but whoever would like to start. Well, um, since I hogged the mic for a bit, uh, if you allow me to hog it for a few seconds more, uh, at, at least for us as Zeon Collective, because when we were starting in a lot of our activities in the kingdom, um, it was a space that was very fraught. Uh, there was a lot of us versus them type of mentality going into dialogues, and we find that one pathway was very useful. Uh, we created a whole program, actually, hopefully, hopefully, that we'll be successful with. I, I see our program manager here, Jeremy Adabdallah, but we call the tree library. We found that if you bring people, first, outdoors, um, everyone thinks of Saudi Arabia as a desert land. Well, Riyadh means oasis, so we can grow an ample amounts of trees. 
you bring people close to trees, in close proximity, and this was a trick that I learned from my grandmother, the way that they used to tend to their land, and by the way, uh, sidebar, sustainability is a lot closer to us as a people than the rest of the world, because it's not how our ancestors used to live, it's how my grandmother and my grandfather used to live. So she reminded me of the power of having productive gardens in your home, and that's where we chose to have a lot of these difficult conversations. One, in a circle, Two, surrounded by what was called paradise garden. So if you went through a space and grabbed a bit of fruit, you, you know, all of your anxiety is already definitely lower, lower cortisol le levels, what we were trying to aim for. The second was that we were encouraging people to represent their own opinion and not that of their institutions. Meaning everyone was sitting in a circle, there were no panels, no images in the backdrop, and everyone was there and encouraged to see not the usual rhetoric that we you know, used to hearing in different spaces, but to bring their sincere concerns to the table and to try and dissect the problem piece by piece to reach an eventual conclusion. So to us, we saw that, that Bedouin, let's say, approach of decision-making to be very useful uh, in our fourth. I love that. Yeah, Jonas. Yeah, just perhaps a few thoughts uh, to share with you about how we, we tried to reach out uh, to the different constituencies. And uh, some key words for us, first of all, was impartiality. Impartiality about the outcome of the conversation. That is, it, the outcome could be uh, a desire to pursue uh, the use of these techniques or the opposite, <laughs> or not sure. But the impartiality was hugely important. The second was catalytic. We never went into conversations saying what we want to do, but rather we went into conversations with what can you do in your, given your mandate, if you're an organization, your interests and so on, what can you do given that there is this issue that needs to be addressed and somehow incorporated into what you're doing. So impartiality, uh, catalytic. The third was evidence. And that's also very important, and especially in relation to what I said earlier, that so much out there is not based on evidence about these issues, on either side, let's be clear, you know? And, and so we did the best we could to bring evidence in form that could be absorbed by people. And so for the first few years, we had a scientific advisor, and with that help of uh, the scientific advisors, we produced briefing notes, policy notes for busy people, longer evidence-based notes, you know, lots of things, but it, these, these were absolutely crucial. And uh, uh, the, the, the next uh, key issue was, okay, who are we reaching out to? And uh, if solar radiation modification is going to impact everybody, <laughs> then we have to talk to everybody. Of course, that's not possible. Uh, but what we did try to do, and I think reasonably successfully, was to pay special attention to engaging uh, people from the Global South, which was quite difficult in the beginning, but we did it. And if you look at our list of speakers on our uh, C2G talk series or our various online events that we've organized, I think we did pretty okay in engaging people from the Global South. And similar to the Global South, we tried, and you know, I'm not the best example of that, but we did try to do uh, 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 as much as we could to have gender balance in our activities, to engage people from different, uh, um, in the different activities, because that was also very important. This, the, a lot of the discussion about solar radiation modification is basically done by white males like you and I, Michael, right? <laughs> but it's changing, it's changing, and I think that's, that's fantastic, and I think we've uh, managed to contribute to some of that. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I would also add just just uh, I think a couple of sentences. I mean, my when you asked the question, I, I was going like, well, just being honest. <laughs> I mean, talk to people about the things that you know and the things that you don't know, and speculate about the things that you don't know you don't know yet. And 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 from that, I mean, that's that's the basis on which you can really engage, and that also then touches on deep lying concerns that we, I think, all have uh, when it comes to some of those ideas of climate interventions. And that's 
already played out, I think, quite nicely when it comes to contextualizing carbon dioxide removal as a, it looks like, necessary in the sense of within a big bundle of things that we need to do, necessary uh, type of activity, but we don't really know how easy, how costly, how um, politically attractive and uh, economically attractive those things turn out to be as we go along the way. And so that it requires for us to sort of continually ask those questions and con continually also point honestly to those challenges. Yeah. And I, that also then resolves, in my view, uh, without having to play any games, you know, this issue of moral hazard where people fear that CDR somehow magically undermines uh, every action that we have taken so far. Um, though when we speak honestly about its challenges, I think it becomes very clear that at best it can play a, a small role to complement everything else we're already doing. Right. Wonderful. I think that uh, one of the things that really uh, engaged us uh, at at the time that I was involved in this, around 2010, was realizing that in spite of coming from a scientific background where we like to say that we are data-based and uh, uh, that everything is reason, the public reaction especially to this is as much an emotional reaction to the idea of trying to tinker with nature uh, as anything else. And that's in spite of the fact that, you know, of course, agriculture is probably the biggest, one of the biggest climate interventions that we ever undertook. Uh, but it helped us in some of those discussions to start from a point of understanding how people felt emotionally uh, about this and whether they felt that there were any circumstances under which we ought to take action. And if there were, how would they make a decision personally for themselves that action was necessary. What would they be looking for? Uh, what, what uh, you know, was it a dramatic tipping point? Was it, you know, some magic number like 1.5 degrees C, which people say is a scientific number, but it's not, it's not a scientific number. It's a politically generated number. But, it, you know, is, was there some arbitrary thing like that? Was there something that they would see uh, around them? Was it the, the opinion of someone they trusted? Uh, and to, to understand some of that uh, individual emotion basis for people's decisions uh, was very educational to us uh, and helpful. Thanks. Um, sharing also from my perspective from the Global South, doing a lot of research in the Global South, there have been a lot of nuances and there have been a lot of, I think, even a stigma for um, researcher, uh, researchers, especially because I came from Takloban, which is um, the ground zero of Suprete von Hayan, if you know. And there have been a lot of researchers who came to us and asked for our opinions. And then after they got the data, they just fleed and not return and not even share what are the findings. And I think now, um, this is before I went to do it for my master's. Um, and seeing all of that, kind of like the challenges and the gaps of how our researchers are um, going into immersing into the communities and how they're treating the communities as just beneficiaries or as just respondents of the research and not actually um, not actually treating them as partners, as stakeholders that they can work with even after the research is conducted and after even we they have the the um, the findings of the research. It it really is important for me to know when you go to the community, you don't have all the ideas in your head already. 
you go to the communities with an open mind of what you can learn because you don't go to the community as an expert. You are an expert. Well, you know that. That is why you are a researcher. But for you, I guess, to go to the community and to immerse yourself, you want to be a learner. And the experts are the community members. You don't go to the community and say, I know what, yours, what your problems are. And I am here to research for the solutions for it. You don't go there as that. Um, and I think in our area, we have been really tired of just be tre being treated like that. That is why even in my work right now that I'm doing research, I am very sensitive of how I approach people and not just very um, transactional, but really learning from where they are and what are the issues. And I've did it with my friend last last year, is that we did a research and we don't even know what that research could look like. We just went to the community and immersed with them. What are, what are the things that you're interested to tackle? And then we built our research in there. We're so used to having already the work plan for our research, to having already the abstract of our research. Well, it's needed for funding though, right? But um, it's also very important that the heart of our research is the community people that we want to, to, um, to engage with. And I think it's very important that we foster the transparency in the discussion and um, the, to acknowledge the concerns of the community people. I think it, it would make, um, for me at least, since I was one of the beneficiaries because before I came um, into this work, I felt that open communication, sharing of research findings, and involving diverse stakeholders in the decision-making process can help address the concerns and to build really the trust um, with the community members to your respondents and to the researchers. Thank you. Great. Um, excellent discussion and, and great perspectives on how to um, you know, engage the voices in this dialogue because it really is a need where we all need to come together and have these difficult conversations. And with that, I wanna see if there are any questions from the audience for the panel and maybe we'll take two uh, just back to back and then um, let the uh, panelists respond. We have one here and is there a second? and then one in the back. So we'll go with these two questions and then uh, let the panel respond. Yes, thank you. And thanks to your distinguished uh, speakers on all the thoughts shared with us. I come from West Africa and uh, we experience Hamatan, which is a season where we get naturally dust in the atmosphere. And that process brings a cooling effect to us during the period. So I'm currently doing a research on solar radiation management and looking at how we can implicate uh, Hamatan season by, so, so let's say the Hamatan period is about three to four months in the year. And the other year, other month of the year, we have our normal atmosphere clear. And so we still have the heat system that we have. So I'm looking at how we can implicate this uh, process so we can have cooling all year round. Now the question is, what is the implication on the climate? Not immediately, because we know what happens immediately with the cooling. And even with, temp even with rainfall, we have an idea what happens to rainfall patterns within the year. But we are not sure of the long-term effect. I also, I work with the IPCC as a, as a vice chair in working group one. Again, the question comes with the long-term effect of these interventions. I believe that we should not stop research. We should not stop these conversations. We have to continue and allow innovations, especially with the youth, the young people, I see the exuberance and their capability to want to contribute to the solutions. So I feel, and I relate to Matthias' uh, new research in doing responsible research, we should be guided by the principles as much as possible, but we should 
really be open-minded and allow the research to, to go on. At the end of the day, what we want are solutions, and so we should be open to, to that as well. But I have a question. Uh, having COP here in Dubai, there's already BBC News asking these questions out there. But then if we have an oil company or um, country supporting research in these um, CDRs or SRM or all this intervention, are we going to call it as a conflict of interest in any way? That's, that's where I end. Thank you. Wonderful question, and thank you again for your perspective and context before. There was one question in the back, and then we will ask both uh, to the panelists as we have about four minutes left. Hi, thank you all for the great interventions. It's really nice to see at this end of the third year of the decade that you can already talk about co-production, Global South, and uh, I mean, we are moving forward of this. Uh, my point is, how can we look for the next seven years and the challenges we still have? Like, if you consider like in COP now, uh, there is one challenge issue that is also funding. So we have awareness net now of the importance of co-producing and not coming with the, the, the final answer to a community or a country, but to stay and listen and exchange knowledge with them. Uh, we know the importance of working all together, but we know that the Global South has less money as well. So how can we consider funding that is equity in this discussion for the climate, the ocean nexus as well? That is the big, biggest question for the, 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 the uh, climate and the COP as a whole. But look for us here in the ocean climate nexus. What should be options for the next years? Wonderful. So uh, just to recap, a question kind of on sources of funding and potential conflicts of interest, as well as the need of mobilizing funding for research in this space. Um, who would like to go first? Okay. I can go first. As a, an oil producing nation, I, I think the first question could, uh, could be of relevance. Um, so I, I, the way that we look at the problem is from two different lenses. The first is question that we get a lot around the seriousness of our engagement. You know, is Saudi Arabia serious about what it's doing? Is it more window dressing? I mean, I can only speak to Saudi because I'm a Saudi. And I, I can feel it in the UAE that there is a lot of similarities. But there are two things that we have to keep in mind. The first, when we're talking about keeping 1.5 alive, well, to, it is a political number, I agree. I was there when they, they came up with it. And I was like, what? The science says zero is safe, not 1.5, right? <laughs> But we're already way beyond that. Uh, the 1.5 in our region means 2.9. Um, so yeah, it, it is serious. And, and the two degrees is quasi five. And why does that matter? Well, you are a scientist. And I took one course in Earth's oceans and atmosphere. And I can do a back of the you know, envelope calculation. But I understand, even in my basics of science, that Anything that influences one aspect of the dynamic has cascading effects that God knows what it might uh, keep at the end of it. The other is in terms of the viability of companies. In my opinion, um, I can say it with uh, hopefully a good soul, there's some need for oil and gas to exist within ecosystems. We saw this with covid the biggest shock that we've ever faced, yet we were still continuing to pump. Actually, in Saudi, we're getting both questions at the same time. We're being asked to increase our, our pumping of, of oil and gas by all of the world, world leaders in the same breath of saying, stop it and keep it in the ground. When the reality of the matter is that if we are responsible, we have to tackle the emissions until we can safely go to a different way of operations. And to us, emissions at the wellhead, where it matters. Um, we were second to Denmark. Denmark decided to keep all of its oil on the ground. So now Saudi Arabia is at the top of the list when it comes to the cleanliness of our extraction, let's say. So in that sense, I wouldn't tell you what to think is viable or not, but there's a lot of know-how that the oil and gas industry has. And if they are, you know, if they should be walking the talk, then we should be leveraging all of their know-how to help create geological methods of storing that carbon. We went down that pathway before, by the way. We were in a lot of these moral hazard conversations. I, I can remind you all in this room about adaptation. <laughs> when we were told, do not talk about adaptation because it will 
put everyone to focus on that and not in mitigation. Well, we haven't done anything of value on mitigation, and there are places, if we, you know, it's not about these talking points, it's about sincerity to people who are on the front line of being hit and bombarded with all the, these effects. We did not work on adaptation, and now these people are feeling it on the front lines. So we need to have a more mature conversation that does not antagonize one position and that really focuses on the science and the science-led effort to try and figure out a pathway for all of us. I, I would also like to address that first question, and uh, maybe from a different angle. I think conflict of interest is maybe not the, the most helpful way into this question. I would put it more that if any country talks about carbon dioxide removal or solar radiation modification without integrating into an overall strategy to deal with the climate, then it's wrong. It's simply wrong. And so uh, it's, it's not whether or not there is conflict of interest, but where do you put it? And do you just look at this in a silo or rather look at it as part? And we talked a lot about moral hazard awards, but we haven't really discussed what that means. And, and I think this is so important that one way to reduce the moral hazard, even potentially to eliminate it, is to ensure that any policy discussion about carbon removal or solar radiation modification be part of a bigger picture of addressing the climate and actually even the bigger picture of addressing sustainable development. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists here today for giving the time and having this conversation. Um, I've learned a lot, even just through the dialogue and the different perspectives here. Um, and we hope you have a good rest of the COP. And we'll stick around a, a little, a few more minutes for uh, additional questions. Thank you. Thank you.